So welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Farden. I'm one of the chairs of Grand Rounds, along with Leslie Crichton, who is tucking into her lunch in a little box up there. Um, and uh, just thank you very much for, for coming along today. This is the last uh, Grand Rounds of February, and February is LGBT plus month. Um, and we always try to set aside some of our Grand Round time uh, in February for the LGBT community and LGBT um specific talks. Um, uh, last week's talk chaired by Kevin McConville um, is not yet up on the YouTube channel but it will be very soon um, and I'm looking forward to watching that because I, I was away on holiday. Um, this week, this year we've got two talks on um, an LGBT theme and this week we've got Katie Hans who's one of the consultant haematologists here in NHS Tayside who works in the blood transfusion service. She's a regular at Grand Round. I don't know how many talks you've given now, Katie. It must be four, five, six. That's a number, certainly. Um, um, and she is going to talk about uh, the changes to the blood transfusion service here in Scotland, with particular reference um, to uh, members of the LGBT community um, and their ability to be able to give blood uh, and other products. So, Katie, if you'll share your screen, I'll leave it all to you. Thank you. Uh, oh, hang on. Mm, sorry, display my ineptitude. Okay, and then is that us? And you've got, can you see the right thing? That's perfect, Katie. On you go. Yeah, super. Okie doke. Well, thanks very much for having me to speak here today and for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to be talking a lot about today are the processes involved in blood donor selection, but also in donor deferral. And that is the term that's used to describe restrictions that are placed on people who wish to donate blood. And these might be temporary, um, for example, due to a recent illness, um, including the disease of the moment COVID. Um, so you can't donate for 28 days after resolution of symptoms from COVID. Um, but in some instances, they can be lifelong. Um, and this is the case, for example, for people who've ever injected drugs. And I want to acknowledge at the beginning that Turn, being turned away from donating can be really tough. Um, people want to donate blood, generally speaking, because they want to help other people. So not being allowed to can be upsetting. And that can be upsetting if they're deferred because of an issue with their own health. So for example, if they're found to be anemic um, and it's not safe for them to donate. But it might feel even harder for people who are unable to donate due to what they feel to be unfair or discriminatory rules which are in place. Um, as has been the case for individuals affected by the deferrals which are and have been in the past in place for gay men. Um, broadly speaking, these deferrals were introduced in the early 1980s when it was identified that HIV was more prevalent in the gay male population than the general population. And they were introduced aiming to reduce the risk of an infected individual donating blood which might go on to um, infect a recipient. So these deferrals were, and still are, applied to all men who have sex with men, but do not take into account the fact that both within the gay population, there will be individuals who are at low risk, and nor do they account for heterosexual individuals who may be in a higher risk group due to their sexual behaviours. So in an attempt to assess whether changes to these population based deferral criteria could be safely undertaken. So could we make changes to these um, <clears throat> donor acceptance criteria without increasing the risk of an infected donation entering the blood supply? The FAIR group was assembled and this stands for the for the assessment of individualized risk. And this group was assembled in 2018 and aim to consider both behavioural and epidemiological aspects of moving to a more individualised risk assessment, which could be um, introduced across the four UK blood services. So really looking to consider whether rather than using a population based deferral for men who have sex with men, an individualised risk assessment could be undertaken, which in turn would allow lower risk gay men to donate. And the FAIR group had representation from each of the four blood services, from patients, from donors, and from interested parties, including the LGBT plus charities. The conclusions from the FAIR group were reported in December 2020 and were in the press and so on at that time. 
And these um, conclusions recommend that the UK blood services ought indeed to move to an individualised risk based donor assessment. And the are really there is um, satisfaction that by changing to this um, new way of assessing donors, we weren't going to be increasing the risk to the blood supply. So where are we now? Well, the recommendations from the FAIR report are in the midst of being translated into guidance for the UK blood services. So at present, we haven't yet received that guidance of how we're going to actually work with um, the, the FAIR report recommendations. But blood services each have their own implementations plans um, and these changes will come into effect in June 2021. Um, and that date is fairly um, set in stone at this time. So having thought a little bit about where we are now, what I thought might actually be quite interesting was to look at how we have got to this point. So where have we come from when we're thinking about um, blood donation, HIV, and men who have sex with men. So this timeline shows some of the key events over the last 40 years or so. And as I said at the beginning, these deferrals were in initially introduced in the early 1980s in the UK and internationally um, as part of efforts to reduce the risk of transfusion-related transmission of HIV. And it was almost 30 years before changes were made to this deferral, um, initially reducing it to 12 months following last sex between men, and then more recently to three months. And alongside these changes, you can see that there have been changes in the testing strategies that are employed by the blood services to test blood donations to ensure that they are safe for onward transfusion to a recipient. So initially, there was testing um, just for the HIV, presence of the HIV antibodies. Um, later in the early 2000s, testing changed and HIV combined testing for the HIV antibodies and antigen was introduced. And then HIV NAT testing, so nucleic acid testing, a more sensitive test, was introduced in 2003. Um, and really these advances in testing combined with increasing knowledge about the epidemiology and so on of HIV are what then fed into these um, changes in policy. So to help better understand these decision making processes, I thought it would be helpful to give a bit of background about blood transfusion in the UK and the various regulations that are in place which try to ensure that donor blood is safe to be transfused to a recipient. So in the UK in 2019, just under two and a half million blood components were transfused. And this has been falling year on year. And over the last decade or so, it's fallen from about three million down to where we see now. And this is in large part due to changing transfusion practice and an increasing evidence base about when and when not to use um, blood transfusion. There are four blood services in the UK um, and each collect and manufacture blood components for their own population. So blood collected in Scotland is transfused to Scottish patients. As you can see, the ma vast majority of blood in the UK is transfused by NHS BT, NHS Blood and Transplant, who are the English blood service. And this just reflects the fact that the English population is much larger. And transfusion in Scotland consistently accounts for about 8% of components transfused in the UK. In terms of the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service, so we um, collect blood all over Scotland. There are five donor centres um, based in the big cities, as well as donor teams who will go out um, to mobile donor sessions to collect blood. Um, blood donations are then taken to the Jack Copeland Centre in Edinburgh, which was a purpose built facility um, where blood donations are tested and then manufactured into the various blood components. And this blood is then supplied to hospital blood banks around Scotland for transfusion. And SMBTS also provides other services for patients. So we provide a therapeutic apheresis service um, in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Um, we provide blood banking services, so hospital blood banking, like we do here in Nine Wells, um, at um, hospitals in Edinburgh and Glasgow, Aberdeen and Inverness. And then we provide a reference service where blood banks that are trying to identify particularly tricky antibodies and things in their patients are able to send samples to us um, for a reference service to help them um, identify these 
And blood transfusion is very tightly regulated, um, as any of you might have, who might have um, been on the receiving end of sending a mislabeled blood sample to the lab, you know that we have rules about everything. And these rules really start from the law um, which governs um, blood safety. So um, the blood safety and quality regulations um, mentioned on the left of this slide here, um, translate the EU blood blood directive into UK law. And these were recently updated in response to the EU exit. And these regulations set standards for the quality and safety of the whole um, blood transfusion process. So this is, includes blood collection, testing, processing, storage, and onward distribution of blood. And these include the stipulation that all blood must be traceable vein to vein. So all the way from donor to recipient so that any instances of potential transfusion transmission of an infection can be appropriately investigated. The MHRA, who are the Medicine and Healthcare Product Regulatory Authority, ensure that blood services and blood banks are compliant with the BSQR through regular um, inspections. And we here in Nine Miles are ordinarily inspected every couple of years by the MHRA to make sure that we are complying with all of those regulations. SABTO is the Standing Advisory Committee for the Safety of Blood Tissues and Organs. And this um, committee advises UK ministers and health departments on the most appropriate ways to ensure the safety of blood. And they are really the, the group who play a really key role in any changes which are to be made to donor selection criteria. And in the case of the FAIR report, for example, SABTO review the, review the conclusions from the FAIR report um, and then were satisfied that the proposed changes would not negatively impact upon the safety of the blood supply. They then make the recommendation to the UK government that the changes be accepted um, and it's then passed by the government and the, the departments of health. JPAC are the Joint UK-BTS Professional Advisory Committee and they're responsible for translating um, these um, recommendations from SABTO into guidelines that are used by the blood, UK blood services. Um, so they have a website which has a huge amount of um, guidance on there for, again, for everything from donor selection through to manufacturing of blood components, um, making sure that each blood bank and blood establishment is working within the guidelines. So as you can see, there are a lot of strands to ensuring that the blood available within hospitals is as safe as it can be for transfusion to patients. So on a background of all the regulation and guidance that I've just discussed, there are really two main arms to ensuring the blood that enters the blood supply is safe. And these are donor selection. So who do we actually take blood from? And then how do we test those donations to make sure that we are as satisfied as we can be that there is no risk going to be conferred by transfusing that to a recipient. So if we think first about donor selection, there's really two main principles to donor selection. First of all, we want to make sure that the donor will not be harmed themselves if they give blood. So making sure that they don't have any underlying medical condition that might mean they'd become unwell following donation. And secondly, we perform a risk assessment to try and ensure that there's not a risk that a donation may harm a recipient. And this includes assessment um, by asking questions, looking for risk factors for things like HIV, but also to ensure that the donor is well on the day of donation, because there are lots of other um, infections which could potentially be transmitted um, via blood transfusion. So ultimately, this aims to ensure that there's a low incidence of viral infections in the donors. And we know this is effective because if we look at rates of, for example, HIV or hepatitis C infection in the general population and compare that to the um, incidence in our donors, so um, donations which test positive, we, are dem we can demonstrate that there is um, a much lower incidence of infection in the donors that have been selected through these processes. The way that donor selection is done at session is through the use of a questionnaire like this one. And this is a shot of the current um, donor questionnaire that's in use in Scotland. 
And the safety of this process really relies on the donor being open and honest in their answers. And there's a panel just at the left of the slide there that you can see, um, which explains why this is important. And it's important so that we are not taking blood from someone where it may cause them harm. But it's also important from the point of view of thinking about onward transfusion to a recipient. Um, so we really do rely on donors being honest um, in this assessment so that we are selecting people who, um, who are as safe as we, we can make it in terms of blood donation. Following this, if the donor is cleared to donate, they then have their haemoglobin checked and providing it satisfactory, then a donation of about 450 mils of blood will be taken. Tests are then performed on each donation each time. And these tests include the so-called mandatory markers, which are listed here. So HIV, hepatitis C, H hepatitis B, hepatitis E, syphilis and HTLV are the mandatory tests. And I've put more detail there about the testing that is performed for the three big viruses, if you like. So HIV, we do serological testing for anti-HIV 1 and 2, or as in the case at the moment, what we do is check for HIV 1 and 2 antigen slash antibody using this combined test. And then we do nucleic acid testing, um, which is looking for actual viral nucleic acids within the donation. So the combination of those two allows us um, greater certainty that we will pick up um, any infection um, in a donation. The initial tests, the serological tests are performed on individual donations, but for the nucleic acid tests, those are performed on pools of um, 24 donations. Um, which still maintains the sensitivity that we need um, to be able to detect low levels of virus in, in the donations. And if any of these tests are reactive at the initial test, the donation will be discarded at that point. OK, um, and so that we know even if it turns out these initial results were for false positives, we're happy that that donation has been made safe and is not going to be um, at risk of being transfused to a recipient. Um, there will then be confirmatory testing performed on the samples and if these confirm infection then the donor will be contacted, obviously informed of the results and then there's an interview which will be undertaken to try and identify risk factors and so on for where they may have contracted that infection. And the other thing to note is that sometimes we will perform additional testing. For example, if somebody gives a travel history where they've been to a uh, um, an area where there's a risk of malaria, for example, or West Nile virus. Um, so we can do additional testing on donations as required, again, just aiming to ensure safety. The data regarding positive donations are then reported to the NHSBT Public Health England Epidemiology Unit, who've performed surveillance regarding um, infections picked up in donors since 1996. Um, the characteristics of donors which have um, been identified during the post-donation interview um, for those who test positive for infections are also collated for analysis, as is whether or not the infection has been recently acquired in the donor. And we can determine that when, for example, if we have a, a donor who's been a regular donor, um, who has had previous donations which have tested negative, and then they give blood this time and test positive for one of these markers, then we can say that that's a recent infection because we've got um, historic results within 12 months um, which were negative. We can also say it's a recent infection if the in the case of HIV, for example, if the antibody testing is negative, but we're picking up um, virus via the nucleic acid testing, then we would know that that um, HIV infection had been identified early in the course of the infection. And that's the same for hepatitis C if it was picked up in the similar situation. And on the slide here, I've got the data published for 2019 by the um, NHSBT Public Health England Epidemiology Unit. So you can see there were 1.8 million donations in 2019, and of those, 206 tested positive and were discarded. 
Um, and you might note this is fewer than the 2.3 million blood components that were transfused in this year, and that's because a single donation can be manufactured into up to three components. In 2019, there was one confirmed transfusion transmission of hepatitis E, and that's a virus which the blood services have been screening for since about 2017, when it was identified to be um, more prevalent in um, in the population. Um, and then there was one case of probable hepatitis B transmission. Since the surveillance began in 1996, there have been two incidences of hepatitis C transmission, and the last one was in 1997, and two incidences of window period donations of HIV. And I'll talk a wee bit more about window periods in a minute. Um, and these, this resulted in HIV infection in four patients. And both of those were, both of those instances of the HIV um, transmission were before the HIV nucleic acid test was introduced. And the last of it, last of these infections was in 2002. So it's really the fact that this robust, or one of the reasons we're happy to, to think about changing deferral criteria is that we've got this really good robust surveillance system, which allows for the monitoring of the impact of changes to deferral criteria. So it gives confidence that any change in the incidence of infection in donors will be identified early and can be acted upon. So um, helping to keep the blood supply safe. So I mentioned window periods a minute ago. So what we mean by window periods is a period during infection where there may be sufficient virus present to be infectious, but it is at such low levels it's not detected by testing. And this is one of the big concerns is if somebody donates blood during the window period, um, they may have an early stage infection which um, is capable of um, causing infection in a recipient, but it's at such low levels we don't detect it um, in testing. And this is why deferrals are put in place to try and ensure that people can't donate during that window period after a high risk activity. And the window period is affected by various things, the virus itself and how fast it replicates, as well as the sensitivity of the tests. And the window period shown here for H hepatitis C, B and HIV are those calculated for the testing as it's performed on blood donations. So NAT testing in pools of 24 donations. And as you can see, the hepatitis B window period is significantly longer than the others. And so when we calculate an appropriate deferral period, it's recommended that you use the um, twice the longest window period plus 30 days. So that's how we end up at that three months, which is the sort of standard deferral period at the moment. So if we come back to our timeline, looking at the deferral, um, the history of deferrals for men who have sex with men, you can see that the first big change came in in 2011 when the lifelong deferral was reduced from 12 months, uh, sorry, was reduced from lifelong down to 12 months. Now, the EU blood directive that I mentioned, which is what um, is basically part of UK law, so it states that persons whose sexual behaviour puts them at high risk of acquiring severe infectious diseases that can be transmitted by blood should be deferred and that the deferral should be appropriate to the risk posed by the behaviour, but it doesn't give advice on exactly how that should be applied. So it's left up to individual countries to assess the local epidemiology relating to these viruses um, and the risk to the blood supply. And in the UK, decisions regarding these deferral criteria are made following made by following recommendations by SABTO, as I discussed earlier. So in this case, um, I should mention as well, there was an, an earlier review performed in 2006, but at that time there wasn't felt to be sufficient evidence to allow um, an informed change. So there was still wasn't sufficient evidence that a change to the deferral criteria at that point would be safe um, in terms of not causing an increase in infected donations entering the blood supply. So a review was undertaken, which reported in 2011, 
And this was undertaken by uh, another group who were tasked to review the evidence base for these donor deferrals in relation to sexual behaviours and then to make recommendations to SABTO. And this review included an analysis of the epidemiology of the infections, both in donors um, and in the general population. It considered testing performance, it considered operational issues. So how would the blood services make that change? Were they going to be workable? Um, and they also considered the ethics and the equities, uh, equity of these deferrals on populations affected. So including um, the population of gay men. So in 2011, the, SABTO did make the recommendation that the deferral could be reduced to 12 months um, because there was not felt to be any increased risk to the blood, blood supply with this change in policy. But following this review, there was also a recommendation of the need to try and make some sort of assessment of how compliant people were with donor selection criteria. So as I said earlier, donor honesty in answering the donor health check questions is key um, because there is a certain amount of assumption made when these deferral criteria are put together um, that people will be honest um, in order that safety of the blood supply is maintained. So as part of that review of compliance, a huge survey of about 65,000 um, UK donors was performed, um, asking various questions, including many of those included on the donor health check questionnaire. And all respondents were also asked um, why they disclosed information in the survey, which they hadn't disclosed at the time of donation. And the, the data um, gathered was then analysed and donors were identified as non-compliant with donor selection criteria if they had answered the survey questions in such a way that would mean they wouldn't have been accepted as a blood donor. And overall, the resulting data was very reassuring um, in that there was a very high level of compliance within the donor population and a very high level of compliance within the um, population of men who have sex with men as well as a subgroup of that study. Um, so this was all very reassuring. Donors were also asked about their motivation for donation um, and responses to that question showed that test seeking behaviour, so people donating blood in order to obtain um, testing for bloodborne viruses was also very low. So that's reassuring from the point of view that people who considered themselves to be at high risk of bloodborne viruses and needing a test were not presenting as donors. So following a further review, which um, had demonstrated no increase in, in infections following the 2011 policy change, in 2017, this um, donor deferral was reduced to three months. And that was consistent across all bloodborne infection risks, apart from people who inject drugs. And that's because um, that is part of the, the BSQR law, um, the, the def permanent deferral of people who inject drugs. And this um, three month deferral for men who have sex with men is what remains in place just now um, and will remain in place until the new processes come into play in the summer. So I thought it might be of interest to put some figures on how safe the blood supply is at the moment. Um, and these data are published every year and they're calculated using the previous three years data on the virus incidence in donations. Um, and that's the incidence of new viral infections identified in donors. And it's multiplied by the window period for the assays. And you can see that the risk for all of the, the three main infections there is less than one in a million donations. And with around 2 million donations in per year in the UK, this translates to potentially two hepatitis B positive donations um, being missed by testing one HIV positive donation being missed by testing every 12 years and one hepatitis C um, positive donation being missed by testing every 76 years. And ongoing surveillance of the incidence of donor infections will obviously be closely monitored following the implementation of the new processes so we can identify any increase in infection rates within donors um, promptly. One um, 
special situation which I thought it was worth highlighting here is that the three month deferral which is in place for people who have taken antiviral medications as either PrEP or PEP will remain. Um, so this is people who take antiviral medications as either pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV infection. Um, and this is because of the effects of these drugs have on the sort of natural history, if you like, of HIV infection. So it may result in um, lower levels of um, the virus being present, which might be below the limit of detection. And it may also redu um, result in a delay in production of antibodies, which might therefore impact upon what the infectious window period is for the infection. As I mentioned, the, the window period for HIV is considerably shorter than that for hepatitis B. So having a three month deferral period is precautionary. And this will be reviewed as further evidence becomes available. And that includes um, the new PrEP guidelines, which are currently being prepared by the British HIV Association and the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV. Um, so as I say, even with the, the changes that, that come in the summer, then people who have taken PrEP or PEP will still um, be subject to that three month deferral following um, them taking that medication. So having discussed where we are now in terms of blood donation for gay men, I thought for the last few slides of my talk, I would just focus on other issues relating to transfusion and the LGBT plus community, looking particularly at issues which may affect trans people, whether they're donating blood or potentially receiving transfusion as a patient. And when I say trans people, I'm using that as an umbrella term to describe people whose gender is not the same as their sex assigned at birth. So what's the issue here? Well, in large part, the issue is down to the fact that transfusion guidelines and processes are gender specific and they're binary. So if a patient is female, use this transfusion protocol. If a donor is male, use their donation for these purposes. But these processes and various guidelines need a bit more thought when we are going to apply them to trans people. And a very limiting factor in all of this are the IT systems, which are used again to ensure safe transfusion, but they often require entry of a patient or donor's gender as male or female, which obviously can be prob problematic for some um, when we're thinking about the trans community. This article was published in Transfusion, which is the big American transfusion transfusion journal in 2017, around the time that Caitlyn Jenner had come out as trans. And reading this was probably the first time I'd considered some of the issues faced by trans people who want to be blood donors. Um, in their introduction, the authors of this article comment that they searched for the term transgender in the transfusion journal at the time of writing and only got four hits. And all of those were articles focusing on um, issues relating to men who have sex with men. And I repeated that search yesterday and got 22 hits. So I think these issues are something which is being considered now by the transfusion community, although I think we do still have a way to go. And some of the issues described in this article, I think, are similar to those which trans people face when accessing any sort of health care, um, as Oceana presented last week. So anticipation of what it will be like um, to be asked their gender as part of the donation process. Will other questions be asked? How will staff handle this? Um, and as I've said previously, the fact that transfusion systems are set up to be binary male, female. There are probably more questions about all of this than answers when we start to think about it. But how should donor selection criteria be applied, for example? If we're talking about men who have sex with men, are we talking about trans men? Are we talking about trans women? How do, how do we apply these selection criteria? What haemoglobin threshold should we be applying when we know that testosterone levels are one of the things that influence um, haemoglobin levels? So if we're saying people can't donate with a haemoglobin below a certain threshold, how do we select that threshold for trans people? Some of these issues, I think, would be likely to be made simpler with the introduction of the individualised risk assessment. Um, and I think we hopefully that will make a difference. 
but there are some issues which I think we need to have a bit more of a think about. So if we think about transfusion as um, related acute lung injury or TRALI, um, that is a complication of transfusion, which is caused by the presence of donor anti-neutrophil antibodies reacting with white cells in the recipient and causing um, uh, acute respiratory um, issues following transfusion. And it's more common following the transfusion of plasma components because they have more um, antibodies present. And these antibodies are often stimulated by pregnancy and therefore the UK blood services only make fresh frozen plasma from donations from men to reduce the chance of trally. But this again might be an issue if a donation from a trans man who's previously been pregnant is manufactured into a plasma component. So that might increase the risk of trally in a recipient. So how could we modify our system so these sort of issues can be avoided? And I think one way of doing this might be introducing a two-step gender identity question where all donors are asked for gender as well as sex assigned at birth, which would allow donations to be managed appropriately. And a similar two-step approach to gender identity might also be helpful when we think about trans people as patients. So people of childbearing potential who are exposed to foreign red cell antigens might make antibodies to these foreign red cell antigens, which, and these antibodies can then cross the placenta in pregnancy and cause anemia in the fetus or newborn. So to try and avoid sensitization, specific blood components negative for particular antigens, for example, KEL, will automatically be selected for women up to 50 years of age as they are identified as having childbearing potential. But the processes in place don't currently identify trans men who may have retained childbearing potential for whom we should be applying these protocols. So again, a two-step approach, including both gender identity and sex at birth for all patients would allow these processes to be safely applied to all, including trans people. In a similar vein, if we think about the management of samples during pregnancy, RHD negative pregnant people will be offered anti-D prophylaxis, again, to reduce the chance of anti antibody formation and subsequent anemia in the fetus or newborn. But some transfusion lab systems don't actually allow issue of anti-D to male patients. So again, how do we ensure that trans men who are pregnant get the same level of care as a pregnant cis woman? And in reality, there are workarounds, but I think ideally we need to look at these issues and work with our IT providers to find solutions. Finally, if we think about how we manage historic results from a trans person who may have a previous transfusion file under a different identity, we need to make sure that these historic records can still be traced to the individual. Firstly, so we can satisfy laws regarding transfusion traceability, so maintaining that vein to vein traceability. But perhaps more importantly, because sometimes results of pre-transfusion testing can change over time. And in order to provide safe components for transfusion, we need to be able to access all of those historic results so that we can um, use the results from those tests at the time we're um, providing blood so that we make sure that blood is um, safe that we're providing for transfusion. But again, this needs to be done in a manner which is acceptable to all. So. Again, I think lots of questions when we think about um, trans people as patients and transfusion, but um, I think the conversations about how to address these questions are starting. So in closing, to sum up where I think we are now, since that was the title of the talk, um, I think we can say we're well on our way to a more inclusive approach to donor selection where fitness to donate will be assessed on individual donor behaviours without using any gender-based selection criteria. And as I've outlined in the last part of my talk, I think we do have further to go to make our transfusion systems more inclusive for the care of trans people, both as donors and patients. But I think the conversations there are starting and I hope that we'll be making progress in this area soon too. So I'll just finish there by thanking um, colleagues, so Lorna McClintock and Jane Hughes, both work in the donor services team of um, SMBTS, and then Megan Rowley, who's one of my patient services colleagues in Edinburgh, and there's some references as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Katie.
That's really, really interesting stuff. And um, you know, I think sometimes we, it's very easy to just go on a ward round and say, write up two units of red blood cells for this anemic person and uh, walk on to the next patient. And that, that it's not obvious, not as easy as all that. There's an, an awful lot behind the scenes that we perhaps don't fully appreciate. Um, and um, I, I was at lunch just before this and I, somebody asked me what's on at Grand Rounds Day. I said oh, we were going to talk about the LGBT implications of, of donating blood. And they said, well, what's that? Surely, surely there's no issue. And, clear, and clearly there has been for a long time and it, we're only just starting to get out of, of the, the, those issues. Um, you mentioned, this is a tangential thing, you mentioned about other infections and risks of being in other places. So I had, I've had malaria at some point and then I was, I was told I could never give blood having had malaria once and then I was told maybe I could and then I was told maybe I couldn't. Where, where do we sit with people who've had malaria? Um, I would need to look up the guidelines to check exactly where we are but I think as long as you've then had a test um, we can do we can do a test on the blood that you donate or take samples from you and test those and then determine based on those whether or not it's safe for you to donate. So it's not the same sort of blanket thing it was back in 2003 when I was told that was the end. No, I wouldn't think so. That's lovely. Um, Chris uh, has uh, said, this is a very gay man oriented. Uh, what about bisexual women? Is this taken into account into guidelines going forward? The problem with guidelines, they have to be precise to be inclusive. So I, I suspect you've not not talked about bisexual women deliberately, but um, your brief was to talk about men who sleep with men. But can you talk a little bit about um, other um uh, other other people um so i think what the new process is so it's difficult i can't talk much more about what the new processes will be because they aren't defined yet but the questions which are asked of all donors will now be the same um and they won't ask questions about gender or sexuality or anything along those lines what they will ask is about behaviors so all people will be assessed on their behavior rather than um, anything else so hopefully by doing that then that does it's more inclusive towards bisexual women as well a uh, question from Ali Floyd. It's interesting that IT is proving to be a rate limiting factor. Do you think that computer systems will ever be able to help rather than hinder? And uh, Ali, who I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a he, she or they, so I'll say they, uh, have said great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, I really hope that they can. And I think in lots of aspects of transfusion, our IT systems are really helpful and they perform lots of extra safety steps so you know before we can issue blood from the lab the computer has to be satisfied um, and that's fine because it does increase transfusion safety and automated systems are safer than manual ones and all of these things but there are limitations and I think it's really working with the people who build the systems so that they are fit for purpose is probably what we need to be doing. The difficulty is that there's loads of transfusion systems so if you go from hospital to hospital we all use different ones a bit like how you know the, the patient systems, like some hospitals use ICE and some hospitals use track care, for example, it's similar within the transfusion laboratories. So it's not that we can just do it once and then that's it sorted. It's a case of working, it, unfortunately, with lots of different teams to try and sort that out. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Sarah Olstaff, who is one of our previous speakers uh, for LGBT Month and uh, Grand Round Regular. She has a couple of questions or, or perhaps comments. Hi, thanks. Thanks for your great presentation. Really interesting and um, and so pleased to see this is moving forward, particularly for gay and bisexual men, where there's a, lot, a big narrative around um, cleanliness and contamination and exclusion. So I think this is really uh, fantastic for them. Just to pick up the point about bisexual women, I think that... Um, uh, people who donate blood and people who receive blood, there should be an inclusive service that recognises people's... Um, uh, people who they are. Um, but just to say that bisexual women are at lower risk of acquiring infections, particularly HIV, Hep B, Hep C, syphilis sexually compared to either heterosexual or uh, MSM groups. So just if someone was wondering about the risk there. The other thing I wanted to pick up on, someone has asked, Andrew has asked, um, 
given the incidence of HIV transmission in homosexual and heterosexual sex is approximately equivalent. Just your wording there, Andrew. Um, the incidence isn't the same and the prevalence isn't the same. The numbers diagnosed are about equivalent, but as a proportion of that population, um, uh, we still diagnose a lot more um, the prevalence of HIV in uh, men of sex with men and the incidence is higher than in heterosexuals as a whole group, but within the heterosexual um, subgroup, there are subgroups that are at higher risk, particularly uh, Black African people and people who have sex with Black African people. So again, that would come into the individual risk assessment. Um, so moving on to my actual points. Um, the first thing was about syphilis that you mentioned, because of course um, we are seeing more syphilis now than we have done since the yep. Second World War. Um, and um, I wanted to ask about that. The second thing, um, before I let you uh, answer my question, the second <laughs> thing, I just wanted to clarify in the event that there are any medical students watching, I wanted to clarify the window periods. What Dr. Hans was saying is the window period from, uh, I guess, exposure to detection by RNA or nucleic acid application test, also known as viral load, was nine days for, for HIV. The teaching you get is that the, the window period is 45 days or just over six weeks. Um, and that's when we screen with an antibody and P24 antigen combined assay. So um, so she doesn't have a wrong, we don't have a wrong, we're just talking about different things that we've called the same thing, which is a window period. So yes, on to syphilis, if you would like to speak about that, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be great. Yes, so um, yeah, we test every blood donation for syphilis and yes, we have seen an increase. I couldn't tell you the absolute numbers um, over the last um, while as well. And the FAIR report itself actually has quite a bit about syphilis in it and how, um, so syphilis itself theoretically theoretically could be transfusion transmitted but because of the way blood is stored at four degrees um that kills the bugs basically so it's a theoretical risk rather than a real risk of transfusion transmission but it's an important marker of high risk sexual behavior um, so it can be used as a kind of a surrogate um in testing of donations um as a yeah as I say a sort of a surrogate for high risk sexual behavior. So um, do you screen with an EIA sort of IgG IgM or is it a non treponemal test that you screen with? Pass. I will check and let you know. That's all right. And I was going to say, um, because um, because syphilis is so transmissible by oral sex, uh, you might find that you screen out higher risk people. Um, uh, you know, if you do an individual risk assessment based on, <laughs> let's say, anal sex, uh, <laughs> but because it's so transmissible by, by oral sex, you probably won't screen out um, much syphilis. Um, are there pathways or are, are there ways that transfusion services can be responsive to, for example, local outbreaks? Uh, so, for example, we had a local outbreak amongst heterosexuals in 2013, I think, in Tayside. Is that something that the system can respond to or do you just follow the same processes? Um, probably not, although that's not an absolute. So, for example, there was an hepatitis A outbreak um, somewhere on the outskirts of Glasgow a few years ago. And at that time, we then did not collect from people that lived within a certain postcode full stop and that but that was also because we don't test for each hepatitis a so we had to do something else to try and put that kind of barrier up um so probably not at a, a local level certainly as things stand at the moment but it would be an interesting idea wouldn't it thank you uh thanks to both um um Andrew, who asked about the transition transmission in, in homosexual and heterosexual sex um uh, I think Sarah has answered that question, so thank you. Um, and then Kevin McConville has said, a uh, really helpful update. What are your thoughts on a timeline to make future changes and updates? If you view the process as being where they are now for this set of pending changes, will it always take a long time or are there more future rapid yet safe processes? Mm, tricky. I think um, lots of things in transfusion take a long time. And that's because of all of the sort of governance steps that they go through. And that's true at a local level. Um, but also when we're thinking about these massive policy changes, there's usually so many people that need to be involved in the work that's done to actually inform the, the decision making processes that I think things do take a long time. Um, but hopefully we can be a bit more reactive to how things are changing. Um, and yes, so I hope things will be more rapid in the future, but it's difficult to know.
Now, I try not to mention the dreaded C word during uh, non-COVID related grand rounds, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I just want to highlight uh, to people who may not be aware of the amount of effort and work that's gone on by the blood transfusion teams during COVID times. You may think that's not perhaps not we've not been doing as much surgery there's not being as much trauma and maybe not so much blood transfusion work need to be done but the um but the um the plasma donation uh research that's gone on over the last year um although those studies did in the end turn out to be negative required a huge amount of work from the transfusion teams and i just want to highlight that we locally i understand katie were involved in all that but, but, but at all ends uh, and um Perhaps you could just tell us the, the just the, the 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 amount of work that went into that. There's because I think that's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah, so I suppose actually this is one thing which moved quickly and a bit like I think has happened in lots of aspects of medicine, COVID has made things move more quickly than they ever did before um, in terms of research studies, for example, um, vaccine development and whatever. And I think that's probably true um, in terms of the the convalescent plasma so we were asked or the uk blood services were asked um fairly early on to start collecting um convalescent plasma um for use in clinical trials for covid19 and this was a huge challenge because of all sorts of things so theoretically covid should not be transfusion transmissible because it's a respiratory virus and similar respiratory viruses are not and we don't see viremias often in patients who are sick with covid unless they're really sick in icu and um, so there was the whole bit of thinking about how do we safely collect plasma from recovered people and be confident that we're going to be you know not putting anybody at risk from that point of view there was what are people who are post-COVID going to be like as donors and we've learned some lessons there where there are probably more faints and things in convalescent plasma donors than in standard blood donors so whether that relates to the fact that they've just been unwell or whether it relates to having been unwell with COVID and um, so there is that aspect but actually then manufacturing this whole new component how do we know what the right amount of COVID antibody in the, the component is. So there was lots of work done there looking at what assays were available to measure um, anti-COVID antibodies and what threshold we should be looking for to have a useful component or a potentially useful component to, to study in trials. So it was a huge amount of work. Um, and we are still collecting convalescent plasma at the moment. So there was a pause of about six weeks following remap cap and recovery reporting that there was no benefit seen in the patient groups that had been um, assessed. But there's thought that there might well be a further trial looking at convalescent plasma much earlier in um, COVID. So looking at giving it before patients are admitted to hospital and so on. So um, we're still waiting to hear whether that's the case. And, and the other thing is, sorry, it might be as of today, um, there's been a decision made by the MHRA that for the first time in a very long time, we'll be able to make um, blood products from UK derived plasma. So as a CJD risk reduction measure for many years, we've not made plasma products from UK sourced plasma, um, but that has been lifted as of today. So it might be that we can make COVID um, hyperimmune globulin um, to use as sort of post exposure prophylaxis, for example, um, from the donated plasma. So we'll await developments there. Well, that's uh, that's great news to be able to make blood products from plasma. That's, that's that really is a, a, a big step. Um, fantastic. How many doses of plasma? You told me in the COVID the other day. How many doses of um, covalent plasma were given? Oh, in thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, in the UK, over um, particularly the sort of second wave over Christmas time in down south, there were hundreds of units going out in a day. Hundreds of units a day, amazing. And as Ali says, negative data is still data, and it's and uh, really, really important to, to the, the, for those studies to happen. Right. Um, uh, I think we're done. So um, thank you very much, Katie. You've had lots of questions there, so lots of things to deal with. Thank um, thanks for coming back to Grand Rounds and speaking again. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks for the to the uh, to the audience. The this Grand Round will be edited, recorded, uh, um, uploaded and stuck onto the YouTube channel when I get time to do it. Um, along with all the other Grand Rounds in the last few weeks, you can go to our YouTube channel to see all the Grand Rounds back to about 2015 if you want to catch up with what uh, 
uh, what's happened before. Next week, we have the chaplaincy service uh, are going to come and speak. Um, their talk is called, Even F1 Drivers Need to Stop Occasionally. So we'll hear from the chaplaincy service about what they can do to help with, um, with stressful times as we live in at the moment. So again, thanks so much, Katie. Wonderful talk. Um, and we'll see you all uh, next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>